Now you have seen this idea of conservation of energy at some point in time, whether it's middle school or whether it was another high school course or, or some other spot. You, you've been exposed to this idea of conservation of energy. Now, the definition of energy is the ability to do work, which, if, which creates the parallel between work and energy. We'll get to that uh, coming up here later with work energy theorem. Uh, conservation of energy is something that you've heard. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. Anytime you see conservation, that means that the thing cannot be created or destroyed. It only transfers from one type to another. We're going to talk about specifically two different types, uh, kinetic energy, and this should read gravitational potential energy because there's all types of potential energy. Uh, here, I guess this definition is more general. And so we're going to talk about the transfer between the two, uh, kinetic energy and specifically for us in this unit, gravitational potential energy energy, neither created nor, de nor destroyed. Now this idea of conservation of energy is perfectly true. Um, in reality, we should say the conservation of mass energy, because mass and energy, there's a relationship between those, but that is for another discussion for now. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion, and potential energy is energy that's stored. There's the thing you need to lock on to. Kinetic is all about motion. Potential is all about having it stored, and specifically it's stored because an object is in a force field, like a gravity field, right? A, a gravity force field, and gravity's trying to pull it down somewhere near Earth. Uh, your equation for kinetic energy, and your equation for gravitational potential energy. This is mass times velocity squared. This is mass, 9.81 is your G, and the height above whatever you set your zero to be. Now technically you always have some potential energy, and what you define as your zero is up to you. That's why these deltas are here. So the change in potential energy will get is based upon the change in height, how high up above the ground you are. Uh, I, always, I always recommend set your zero point to either be ground level or the bottom of whatever track you're using. That always makes life a lot easier for you. Um, and then you can drop the deltas for these basic calculations here. We'll have to integrate them back in maybe uh, as we continue along through physics. Now in this simple example, I have a little ball up here, and it's somewhere near the top, and it's, whenever it's at its maximum height, it has all potential energy. It's not moving. You just set a ball there, and you let it roll down some height h to the very bottom. Now as it's rolling down, you're transferring your potential energy into kinetic energy. And whenever you get to the bottom, now you only have kinetic energy. Uh, notice that it is at height zero. So we don't have any more gravitational potential energy. It has all been converted into making the ball speed up as it goes down. So all kinetic energy, one half mv squared, and then the ball starts rolling back up. And so all of this kinetic energy starts transferring back into potential energy. And if we assume there's no friction, you'll get to the exact same height. No energy was lost to friction. And it's not really a loss. That energy is actually just being converted to thermal. Uh, more on that later on. Of course, in between here, where this is all potential, up here would be all potential, down here would be all kinetic. What about the in-betweens? Well, the in-betweens, there's a little bit of both. You're still some height above, so you have some potential energy, and you've picked up some speed in the rolling down, so you have some kinetic energy, and the total energy, total mechanical energy, we should say, is the same, meaning if you add the potential and the kinetic here, it's going to equal the energy everywhere else on this thing. So all potential plus zero kinetic is going to equal the potential and kinetic here uh, being added together, which would equal all the zero potential plus the kinetic here being added, right? And then a mix between the two and all potential. So the idea is energy is never lost. It's always conserved. So what that means is all the energy before equals all the energy after. So whenever you actually break that down and you think about it, that says all of the kinetic energy, one half mv squared, plus all the potential energy, mgh, all initials, right, is going to equal whatever you set as your final spot. So you can choose whatever starting position you want. You pick anything ahead of time. It's going to equal all of your energy final, all the kinetic energy at the end, plus all of the potential energy at the end. Now this equation will not be given to you on the test. Instead, these two will. But this is just the idea of conservation of energy. All the energy before equals all the energy afterwards. Now, don't be surprised as we continue to go if we start integrating other types of energy. Let's say we integrate some stored spring energy, and so we'd have plus a energy for spring energy initial based upon how stretched and compressed the spring is, and a spring energy final on the other side. Now in this example problem, you have a roller coaster, and the roller coaster has gone up the hill and now is at rest 120 meters above the ground. Uh, note I'm saying it's at rest, kind of that's what happens, right? You, you come to almost a stop in a roller coaster before you start going down, and I want to calculate the velocity of the, of the car with the people in it at each point, B, 
C, D, and E. I already know what F is going to be. It's going to be the same velocity as C. Notice how it's at the exact same level, and we didn't add any extra energy. We're assuming this roller coaster isn't, uh, there isn't an engine in this roller coaster adding energy into the system. And I already know what's going to be at G. Notice B and G are at the same level. Now, D is slightly higher, so that's why we're going to calculate D separately in this, in this loop. It's slightly higher than B, 70 meters compared to 60 meters. Whenever I want to calculate this, this could be a very complicated Newton second law, I guess not all that complica complicated, but a complicated Newton's second law problem, or I could use conservation of energy. The beauty of energy is that energy is a scalar. Direction does not matter, nor does time. Notice that time is missing from all of this discussion with energy. Nothing about direction or time here. Now, velocity technically has a direction in it, but I'm almost able to treat it like a scalar whenever it comes to energy. So uh, the, the car is going to come down and I want to know how fast it's going at B. Well, in the beginning, initially, we have all uh, potential energy, mgh and zero velocity, no kinetic energy. So there's going to be a zero that goes in here for the initial starting position all the way um, up here at the top. B is going to be my final. So I can pick any starting position I want. I'm going to pick all the way up here, A, to be my starting position. The reason I'm picking that is because I know everything about A. I know my height and I know my velocity. And I'm going to set the mass of this car to be uh, 500 kilograms with all the people in it. Now, technically, I wouldn't need that, but I'll come back to that here in a minute. Um, so I know the mass, and I know the velocity at A, and I know the height at A. And that allows me to solve for things at B. I know the height at B. I don't know the velocity at B. So let's go through that calculation. So now you can see I substituted everything in. All my masses were 500 kilograms, and of course everything got a little off here uh, because the numbers are a lot larger. Oop, I need to change that to 500, not 50. Um, and then continuing to substitute in, right, my velocity in the beginning all the way at A, and you can pick whatever starting position. Just pick a starting position you know all the numbers about. Uh, you know all the information. Starting position here, zero at the top, and a height of 120 gravity. 9.81 equals, continuing to substitute in, 500. The velocity at point B, because this is all the B side over here, the final side, the thing that I'm trying to solve for, uh, is what I'm looking for. But I do know its height at that point, 60, uh, 60 meters. Now check this out. The kinetic energy part over here completely cancels out because zero times anything is gone. Also of note that I could have pointed out, since there's nothing else here, notice there's a mass in every term, m, 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 m. So all those masses could cancel. You could cancel all those masses out uh, and not even have to calculate that in. I'm going to go through the calculation here just in case um, for us, as if that, that would make you uncomfortable to cancel it out. But note going forward, at any point in time, I might just start canceling out masses, and that is a perfectly acceptable move. Now, please do not be intimidated by how long this looks with numbers. It's really not that big of a deal. 1 half mv squared initial plus mgh initial kinetic plus potential energy initial equals 1 half mv squared final plus mgh final. Kinetic final, potential final. And you declare where your starting initial and where your stopping final position is. Pick your starting to position to be something you know and pick your final position to be what you're trying to solve for. Substitute everything in and then just work the little bit of calculator stuff. I'm going to reduce this down, right, that canceled out. I'm going to reduce this down by plugging into the calculator. I'm going to do 1 half times 500, and I'm going to plug that into the calculator. And now I just need to continue to work my algebra. I simplified down, and so here's the velocity for b. The final velocity is what I'm looking for. How fast are we going there? And so I need to get it all by itself. First thing I need to do is I need to subtract this over. In my last couple of steps in the algebra, I need to divide both sides by 250 now, and then I'll take the square root to get rid of, and don't, don't confuse this equal sign right here with another division. That, that was this minus this gives me that, and now I'm dividing by 250. Uh, anyway, then I'll, uh, after I divide that, then I'll take the square root to get rid of the vf squared. And I come out with 34 meters per second if I went back in here, and I do need to give myself a couple of sig figs by putting a decimal there with the 500, 120 meters. Uh, it gives me two sig figs also. And all the others, by the way, I'm gonna, all the other heights, I'm going to come back in. I'm going to give myself a decimal on those. That way we end up having two significant figures uh, to work with 
and everything. All right, now I'm going to go ahead and do C for you. And then, just to give you a heads up, I want you to hit pause after that. And I want you to do D and E and then hit play and just double check your work. Now, C. In C, we start out, or we are all the way at the bottom. And so that means that we have converted all the gravitational potential energy up here into kinetic energy at the very bottom. And I'm going to start out with a full equation again. Although, if you'd like to just say, hey, it's gravitational potential, initial, there is no kinetic, don't even need to put it in, and it's kinetic here at the bottom, don't even need gravitational potential, that's fine. Also, what starting position to pick? You may pick any starting position you know all the information about. So you could pick A as your starting position, or now that we know stuff about B, you could pick B. My personal opinion is I'm going to pick the information that was given to me in the problem, so it's, I'm not having to worry about rounding, like this is a rounded number here. Um, so I'm not having to go back to the decimals. I'm going to pick A again as my starting position. Picking B would give you the exact same thing. And I'm going to solve for how fast we are now going down at C. So once again, I write my uh, conservation of energy equation. It just says all the initial energy equals all the final energy. And I'm only dealing with two types right now, kinetic and gravitational potential. Substituting everything I know, I'm substituting the masses of 500, although, once again, since mass is in every term, it could have canceled out, so I didn't have to do that. I'm also substituting everything that I know about my starting position and my final position. Um, I am choosing point A to be my starting position, so we have zero velocity and a height of 120 meters. Once again, gravity 9.81 for the acceleration of gravity there. Uh, and my final position, what I'm solving for, C, one-half mass times I'm solving for how fast we're going at point C, uh, plus how uh, much potential energy we have. And the height there is zero. Now, if you had chosen to, hey, I don't even need to put in kinetic energy initial and, uh, and, and put in gravitational potential final, that's perfectly fine because zero times anything is zero. Now, just doing a little bit of calculator work here and here, right? Uh, and so then I'm going to just finish out the algebra to solve for the final velocity. And I come out with a velocity uh, at the very bottom of this hill. You converted all of the gravitational potential into kinetic. 120 meters is a very, very long ways. You come out with 49 meters per second if you neglect friction. So I don't have any energy loss to friction in my conservation of energy or energy converted into friction uh, here in this problem. So that, that's very quick. Now I'm going to go through and I'm going to solve D and E. So why don't you go ahead and pause the video now. Try to solve for how fast the car is going to be going at D and how fast the car is going to be going at E yourself, and then hit play and see if what I did and what you did match up. Now, I'm going to choose my initial position once, to get, once again to be A, but you could choose it for any spot that you know everything of. Uh, so that includes all the spots we've already solved for. And of course, my final position is going to be D. And at point D, we are still 70 meters up in the air because we're at the top of the loop. And so the question really is, how fast are we going now at the top of that loop using conservation of energy? Now you'll notice, since uh, this is multiple problems off of the exact same situation, if you will, the exact same picture, I keep picking part A to be my initial position just because I already know what this entire side comes out to be, so I don't even need to do any of that math. All right, I hope you did well whenever you actually solved those through and you came out with the same thing. Now, I don't want you to be under the illusion that this problem gives that uh, conservation of energy is always about solving for a final velocity somewhere, because it might not be. Let's come back up to this roller coaster. It depends on what you're given. For example, if instead you know how fast the car is going down here at C, you could ask, you know, you know at height, a height of zero and you know how fast it's going down here at C, you could be asked for how high up did it start? 120 meters, and let's say you didn't know that. How high up did it start? And so you'd actually be solving for the initial height. Or maybe a problem like this, where you're throwing a ball straight up in the air, 21 meters per second. How, what's its maximum height that it reached? Kind of a basic kinematics problem that, that you did. You could do that also through conservation of energy, where there is no initial height, hi is zero, and you know the initial velocity. Masses could cancel out here. There's a mass in every term, and the final velocity at the maximum height, final velocity is zero, allowing you to solve for what maximum height does it reach. So you, you can see that energy is a very useful thing, and this idea of conservation of energy can be used to solve almost any problem. And where it really becomes helpful is whenever you have a constant changing direction, like the roller coaster problem, or you don't know anything about time, because that's the beauty of energy. Energy is a scalar. Make sure you write that down in your notes. Energy is a scalar, and it does not involve time, which makes this idea of conservation of energy very, very powerful.
The last thing that I would like to point out about the power of energy is kinetic energy and this type of gravitational potential, that type of potential energy is not the only types of energy that we have to deal with. We can talk about any different type of energy and we can throw all the different types into this conservation equation, just adding it on to both sides. Because of that, you can solve very complex problems with all these different types and pieces and, and all these different things that you are going to be learning going forward in the future, all through just simple conservation of energy.